Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. When you picture in your head the events of the gospel taking place and you hear the word disciples, do you picture old dudes? When you see shows that dramatize the events of the gospels, do you think that they got the casting quite right on the ages? We're going to see one of those seldom taught miracles of Jesus, but it reveals something really profound. Here's Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the temple tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he said. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? From whom do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes? From their sons? or from strangers, from strangers, he said. Then the sons are free, Jesus told him. But, so we won't offend them, go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and you. Remarkable miracle, a fulfillment of something that was prescribed in the Old Testament, but ought not have been enacted in this case because Jesus is the Son of God. It's His temple. <laughs> it also tells us something about the ages of the disciples. Jesus tells Peter to go and to give this coin that would be miraculously given to him. Peter the fisherman, having fished with a net when he was called, now fishes with a hook. And the coin that he's given, this drachma, is going to be, is going to cover the, the temple tax for both Jesus and for Peter. But that's it. You still have 11 other guys, and none of them evidently is old enough to warrant a temple tax. So it very well could be that these disciples were really young when all of this goes down perhaps even younger than they're often depicted in, in popular dramatizations of the gospel events. Wow, like Jesus called these young bucks, this ragtag team of fishermen came in handy in this for, for the setting of this particular miracle, and for a tax collector like Matthew, our author of the very gospel that we've been studying. Wow, that they would be so young, potentially that they wouldn't even be asked to pay a temple tax is, is striking. This is how Jesus did this. He ultimately gets all the credit for this. He's able to produce the temple tax, you know, and it's, it's easy for him to cover, but his question reveals something profound. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? He's speaking to, to Peter. From whom do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes from their sons or from strangers? Okay, the king doesn't tax the prince. The prince is his son and everything that belongs to the king belongs to his son. So Jesus ought not have been forced. It, it, it was not right to ask him to pay this temple tax. The sons are free, Jesus told him. But so we won't offend them. Look at the graciousness here. Jesus performs a miracle that likely only Peter and perhaps the disciples would even really know about. And then the beneficiary would be those asking about asking to collect the temple tax. But it's just, this was done to avoid offending the people presiding over the temple. Have you ever considered the nature of Jesus' first miracle? The wine stain left on the stone, producing, you know, the, forming the, the basins, holding the water that would become wine? It was His. I mean, everything was created through Him, and so that stone exists because of Jesus. Everything has its existence through Jesus. Not one thing was made that hasn't been made through him, and in him we live and move and have our being, okay? The stones forming the basins that would hold the wine belonged to him. The whole, the whole ceremonial washing, that was symbolic of the actual cleansing that would be accomplished by Jesus' work on the cross. The temple, it was about to become obsolete. Jesus didn't have to do this miracle. He doesn't have to do anything. But the graciousness of the Savior is on full display, both in paying a tax at all to a temple that really belonged to him and was about to become obsolete anyway. Moreover, that he would do so for people who evidently didn't believe that he was who he said he was. 
He's just so gracious. All of that stuff is his. All of it was for the worship of him, but so that they wouldn't be offended. He tells Peter, go to the sea, cast in a fish hook and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and for you. In the Old Testament, the tithe was commanded of God because you had in Old Testament theocratic Israel, uh, you, you were ordered by God to pay your taxes that were also tithes. But now in the New Testament era, see Romans 13, this job of enforcing the law has been entrusted to government bodies that exist today. And there's not one that exists that wasn't foreknown by God, in essence established by God. These can be gut-wrenching teachings, but never more so than for the original recipients of some of these teachings, like 1 Peter. Man, I mean, the emperors of Rome were, were brutal from Augustus, Tiberius, and Claudius, Vespasian, Domitian. Nero was absolutely crazy. He was burning Christians alive to light his garden. And these are the ones to whom P Paul wrote, look, like submit to the governing authorities. These are the ones that Peter referred to when writing to persecuted Christians. Like, you gotta, sub you gotta honor the emperor. The emperor just burned my brother-in-law alive. Like the emperor killed my son. I'm supposed to honor him. Nobody had a harder time receiving those teachings than the original recipients. So every governmental institution that exists answers to ultimately the one true perfect form of government, that's heaven, the kingdom of heaven. But in the meantime, here's where we are. Now in the New Testament, we're not required by law to tithe to our churches or to pay taxes to churches. In fact, churches are not to be taxed because of the separation of church and state. Now we give whatever God lays on our heart, which if you lack a clear conviction on exactly what that is, tithing is a great place to start. It's a great place to start. You can use that as a template if God doesn't give you a clear calling, but listen to the Lord because God lays on our hearts what we are to give. And then we saw this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Go back and review that if you have not seen it in a while. You are blessed by God as you do this. So this is a fascinating instance shortly before the expiration of that very policy, the fulfillment of that very policy, Jesus paid the temple tax <laughs> in the coolest way imaginable, but he would pay for the redemption of all who believe in him in the most epic way possible.